Thank you very much for joining us at what I hope will be a very enlightening discussion around sustainability technology in the hospitality industry. I'd like to welcome, uh, I'd like to, well, first of all, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Keith Bradley. I am from Globally, which is an organization based in the UAE that works with businesses to help them be more sustainable. One of the flagship programs we run is a program called Living Business, which is supported by HSBC. And thanks to HSBC support, we can provide free advice and support to businesses who want to be more sustainable. Uh, so please uh, bear that in mind if that's something you're thinking about in your own business. But I'd like to get cracking now. Uh, we have three uh, very esteemed panelists from the hospitality industry. Um, I would like to start, what I will do is introduce uh, each of them as we begin the conversation. So uh, Samuel, perhaps I shall begin with you. Samuel's at the far end there. He's been the quality assurance manager at JA Resorts for I think 12 or 13 years now. And so he's had a lot of experience steering JA Resorts to be one of the most sustainable hotels in the UAE. So Samuel, uh, maybe I can pose a question to you uh, right now. I know that JA Resorts have really pioneered the removal of single-use plastics from their properties. Can you tell us about the process that went into that, the dis how the decisions were made, and what you've done to make that effective? Thank you so much for the warm introduction. Um, I'd first of all like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, yourself, Keith, Alice, and uh, Talid from uh, Dubai Economy and Tourism for uh, welcoming me here to be a part of these uh, dis uh, discussions with this fine gentleman here, and I'm sure it's going to be a very enjoyable, interactive, and insightful session, so thank you. And also I'd like to thank the audience for investing your time here today and for being a part of this talk, so thank you to you all. Um, in regards to the reduction of single-use plastic, this has been a very um, controversial, yet a very challenging uh, topic that uh, has gone around the hospitality sector because it's not only about waking up one day in the morning and saying that we want to reduce all the plastic uh, around the resort. It requires a lot of time, it requires a lot of study, um, it requires a lot of uh, auditing behind the scenes to understand the amount of plastic, single-use plastic that's around um, uh, the resort or in the properties. For instance, uh, in guest rooms, you'd find a lot of uh, single-use plastic that we as a company have taken initiatives to make sure that we can remove these single-use plastics, such as conditioners, shampoo gels in the rooms. We've now um, looked at uh, working on uh, wall bracket uh, mounted uh, you know, conditioners where we can refill. Uh, so that's one of the steps we took. We removed all these uh, single-use uh, plastic uh, bottles also from the rooms. And we took a very conscious decision as a company to invest in a water bottling plant across uh, the entire group. So we were the first hotel group in the region to fully implement a water bottling plant, meaning that uh, we have managed in the last uh, two, three years or so to eliminate about 3.7 million single-use plastic bottles that would have ended up in the landfill or in the ocean. So this was a very huge investment that was done, uh, undertaken by our leadership, and it shows a very firm commitment from uh, our, our owners as well, which was an investment of over one million dirhams in order to do the right thing. So once we did that, we also said it's not about uh, re return on investment only, but it's also about social return on investment. So we want to do the right thing. We want to walk the talk. So we've done quite a lot. Also in F&B outlets, we've removed uh, things such as uh, plastic straws, We've replaced that, um, and we continue to still explore other alternatives on if there's any other single-use plastic left across the resort. So we've, we've done quite a lot. What would you say the biggest challenge was in terms of getting that initiative started? Well, I must say, you know, when you're presenting a project where you're trying to um, sell to the owners and the senior leadership that we need to take a cautious decision and invest over one million dirhams for a bottling plant, First question is, is it a return on investment? Is it something that we really want to budget and do? So you first, ha first of all have to um, drive the, the notion that this is a social return on investment. This is something we're doing to help the environment. 
and to help the UAE economy achieve a circular economy. It's something that we as a company also are very passionate about in terms of uh, being a sustainable uh, organization. So we do walk the talk and our leadership are also committed in investing money if we are doing the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to now introduce Hugo Dominguez, who is the managing director of a company called Energy. Uh, I've known Hugo and Energy for about four years now. They have a fantastic technology which helps uh, anyone who wants to heat hot water, but particularly hotels. So I will hand over to Hugo to maybe say some words about how that te what that de technology is and how it works. Hugo. Good morning, Keith. Thank you for the invitation and the kind words. Good morning, everyone. So our technology is called thermodynamic solar and we are producing hot water for hospitality, uh, among other projects, uh, using the sun radiance and the heat of the elements. Anything we can take out of the environment, we can pass it on to the water. Like that, we can produce more hot water with less storage capacity, with less panels, less space, comparing with traditional solar, no matter if it's sunny, cloudy, dusty, or even during night. So we can produce hot water using solar panels during night, as long as the temperature outside is more than zero degrees. And we can achieve this by using a patent solar panels that inside they don't have water like the traditional ones. They have refrigerant fluid. And we use this fluid because we can absorb much more from the environment using uh, fluid that boils at minus 43 degrees rather than water that boils at plus 100 degrees. That shows you how we interact with the environment. So after harvesting that energy, we have a refrigeration circuit that transports that energy onto the water. And then we give the up to 60 degrees to the, to the hospitality properties. This has many, many advantages because first of all, it's the most performed solar system in the world comparing with solar thermal panels. Uh, we can produce 66% more hot water per panel then we don't need to clean the panels because we don't know we're not using the light we're using the radiance we don't need to do any maintenance on the panels uh, they are not vulnerable to corrosion which is fantastic taking consideration the high humidity levels in the wide during summer and also the the proximity from the gulf the salty environment but the game changer is that we use 80 percent less space when we install the system you know that space here in dubai in uae uh, on the region is a commodity and, and therefore uh, there's never enough space to do this kind of initiatives. So our system, since they don't need to respect the traditional limitations of the solar, like orientation south or inclination of the panels, then we can use space in a much more efficient way. So we can actually put 16 panels, up to 16 panels, where you have space for one panel and, one, uh, and each one of them can produce 66% more hot water. That's why we are the only solar uh, technology for hot water that can retrofit a full building or uh, cope with demand with a new, a new build. And finally, we are the lowest operational cost to produce hot water at 60 degrees in this part of the world. We are in average 90% uh, cheaper to operate than electrical heaters. We are 80 to 85 comparing with boilers and 35 to 40 comparing with heat pumps and traditional solar because during night traditional solar requires an electrical backup. So what we bring to the table uh, for hospitality sector is uh, the possibility not only to, to meet the requirements, the sustainability requirements for corporate or governance, but also to reduce the costs and therefore uh, increase the revenue per room. Thank you very much, Hugo. And finally, I'd like to introduce Russell Impiazzi, who is the executive chef at the Sofitel in Wafi. Now, when Russell and I were talking before this, uh, in preparation for this discussion, Russell, you mentioned that to me that your personal sustainability journey had begun when you were walking uh, in Charing Cross in London, and you'd had a, a, a sort of fairly impactful experience I wondered if you could say a few words about that and how it's uh, informing or changing what you're doing at the Sofitel today. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, look, I, I've, I've been back in Dubai a year and a half now. I've been in Dubai since 96 on and off. Uh, and I was back in London for a couple of years. And you know, one thing you don't see here is, is the homelessness problem. But obviously in London, it's everywhere. And I was walking down to, to Charing Cross Station to get a train home. 
and there must have been about four or five hundred guys, girls, teenagers, old guys who's obviously lived on the streets for a, for a, for a long time. Um, I thought it was a big eye opener for me. Obviously, not not being part of seeing that on a day to day basis. If you're living in London every day, you walk past it every day. Um, and it kind of struck me that there's so many people in need of food every day. Now, fast forward a couple of weeks, we are in a lockdown scenario at the beginning of COVID. Um, and there was this great company called Open Table reached out to us um, and said, look, the airlines aren't flying anymore. We've got about 50,000 meals across East Midlands that we need to do something with. We haven't got any storage facilities. So we kind of reached out to a a few hotels across the Midlands to kind of help facilitate that. And at the same time, I said, look, what can we do down here in London? Um, obviously, hospitality had shut down. We were one, only one of two hotels in London not operating because uh, we were supporting uh, the NHS doctors next door in St. Mary's Hospital, um, plus police and social workers. We were busy. Um, so they connected us with a company called the Felix Project, um, who are an amazing organization who a massive part of, of feeding Londoners who, who desperately need a meal. When, when we first started in lockdown, the first thing we did was really go through every, every dry store, freezer, and walked it up to the local food bank, who were supporting, I think, 50 families at the beginning of, of COVID. Three or four weeks inside, there was three or 400 families, 100% reliant on that one single food bank. Um, and at the same time, we had some really cool conversations with the Felix Project. Um, to, to just divert surplus, food surplus. The farmers were still growing stuff, you know, animals were still being slaughtered. There was so much food in the supply chain that how can we do something positive with it? And it just kind of triggered back to that one little, um, it was like a food truck that had a queue all the way around the block of people desperate for something to eat. So, you know, again, fast forward again, we did nearly 28,000 meals over six months using 100% of food surplus, of food that would have just gone into the bin and you know it was a great way to keep the team engaged we got guys back on furlough just two or three days a week just to help support this food waste initiative that ultimately fed a lot of people who need it and they, these are families these are not guys living on the street we, we we supported so many different organizations through the felix project and obviously when i came back to dubai a year and a half ago um as chefs tend to get hosted at suppliers and i went to one of the largest ones um showing me all the bells and whistles and all the beautiful stuff they had. But I walked into this massive walk-in freezer and fridge uh, and I said, what's this? He said, oh, we're going to chuck this away. There's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly good produce. Um, I said, well, how do you get rid of it? We, we pay a company oh, we pay a company to, to, to throw it away. I mean, you're paying someone to throw away perfectly good produce. Nuts. Um, so again, we had another good conversation. I said, look, just send it to me. And at the same time, uh, the UAE Food Bank are we just do incredible stuff. Um, we connected with these guys. And it's just kind of using that same rationale that good food should never, ever, ever go to waste. And it's, just a, it's a lazy mindset uh, that we're all probably guilty of, you know, even in our own homes, that I just chuck it in the bin. Um, but there's something you can do with it, uh, something meaningful you can do with it. And working with the UAE Food Bank really over the last eight, nine months, it's just been incredible. And again, we've produced another nearly 9,000 meals for these guys. Um, you know, it's not something that, that Dubai is very good at talking about, but there are people in real need of, that are 100% reliable on a UAE food bank donation. So it's just kind of using that mindset that we kind of picked up in London and just used it here. And, and the team have really picked up and it's, it's been a really engaging thing for the team to do. Um, and it just works organically every month now. It's not, our oh, chef says we have to do this. It's, okay, we've got this much, what, what can we do with it? And we take anything. Huh? There's, there's no rules to this. If it's gonna, if it's perfectly good, and you've got another two weeks on expiry date, we will do something with it. And it's just carried on. Um, so it's, uh, it's it's a big win for us. Fantastic, really, really fantastic. T you mentioned that the staff are now, you know, they bought into the project, and 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 how how has that transition happened? I mean, how did you get them involved? Was it was it easy to get them involved? And what impact has ha that had in 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 terms of their own? Uh, their own motivation, I suppose, engagement. You see, you see a change of behaviour. Um, look, it, it, it's it's a hard sell at the beginning because you're creating extra work, right? But it's it's sharing the how and the why, and, and you know, over the past eight nine months, the the, the change in mindset that I've seen, not just in my department, 
but across the whole hotel, it's, it's, it's been really cool to see. And like I said, they drive it themselves now. It's, um, it's, they tell me what, what they've got, how many meals we can produce, and which day we can do it. And uh, we, we then connect with the food bank guys, and they come pick it up, and off it goes. Fantastic, so, fantastic. But they're key to everything. It, uh, unless you get the buy-in from your team, it doesn't work. You've only got one pair of hands, right? So yeah. you've really got really to drive the narrative. Yeah, yeah. Samuel, has that been your experience with the team at JA Resorts as well? They've wanted to engage with sustainability? Yes, I mean, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I wanted to also dive into uh, what uh, he's just mentioned about food waste in general. Um, for us in JA Resorts and Hotels, we have, a, we, have, we have partnered with a company called Wino. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you know what Wino is. It's a forecasting company. So basically, it helps us to forecast food waste from the kitchen. And they're able to tell, you know, for instance, we've seen a huge uh, uh, savings with, uh, in regards to scrambled uh, eggs or baked beans. And uh, moving on in the future, we're also looking at solutions such as uh, compost, uh, compost machine from uh, Wastemaster, which we were pri privileged to have uh, had one in the Australian Expo Pavilion since we were managing that. And the Wastemaster basically is a, it's a beautiful uh, um, uh, compost uh, machine that repurposes waste. And uh, the challenge that we've faced with the teams, if they're not well educated about the need to reduce this, uh, you know, food from the kitchen, from the back of house, and also from their day-to-day -day, uh, lives when they're going into the cafeterias, then that becomes an issue all in all in general. So we just need to focus mostly on training and uh, doing a lot of, uh, you know, updates on uh, reports that we get from these companies so that they're able to also see the numbers and they're able to also support the, the initiative in general. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. Well, yeah, we, we have actually a, a system like that as well. And, and look, it's a pain to set up. A, there's a lot, of, a lot of back work that goes in to set up, put the ingredients in and then, um, but when you see what the information that comes out of it, um, and as I say to you guys, this is never a commercial thing. This is not about saving money. This is about, hey, stop wasting your time overproducing. Um, and look, we're, we're, we're making too much food at the end of the day. But the, the system we use is very similar to Winnow. Um, and we've just partnered with, with Reloop. We did it with, um, again, through the Divine Municipality and the food composting um, system. Now, this is an app. And the data it gives us shocked me. We did it through Ramadan. Um, luckily, we were pretty busy. But we had over 20 tons of food waste, 20 tons. Um, and then we kind of dug a bit deeper into where the hell did we produce 20 tons of, of, of food waste. Um, a lot of it is, is fruit peelings for breakfast. Breakfast is a big issue um, that we're trying to, to, to kind of, you're never gonna get away from waste, but how do you manage it responsibly? And partnering with guys like Reloop and, and the food composting thing. But 20, 22 tons of, of food waste was the actual number. Um, and it, it kind of, we produced I think four and a half tons of compost that goes to 25 local farms in the UAE. So the idea there is to try and to create a full circle philosophy where Food waste is always going to be there, but how do you responsibly manage that by working with the right, right partners? And then goes back to the farms. How do we then partner with the farms? So we've got production, we've got waste, we've got compost, we've got production, and how can we close the loop a little bit? So that's a project we're working on. Um, and the Reloop guys are, are really good. Cool. Look, there's a cost to it. Unfortunately, sustainability has a cost to it. Uh, and this is where everybody needs to get involved, from ownership, from brand, from, from the leadership on the ground, and from, on, and our rank and file staff need to be involved in the conversation because if we're not, my fear is we just go through ticking boxes and we're not creating tangible change. Uh, you spoke about the water plant bottle uh, and we had the same conversation. Um, again, yes, there's a cost to it, but the reality is you're going to spend that over the next year and a half on buying water. So we sold it as a cost neutral thing and it really is cost neutral, but it takes a bit of legwork to get it set up, but it's been massively impactful and mm -hmm. it, it works really well for us. Fantastic, fantastic. While we're on the subject of costs, I mean, getting things uh, across the, the CF or the finance director's desk, I'm sure is a challenge that you've all faced. Um, Hugo, maybe you could say, so I know that the technology you have is, from what I've seen, a relatively easy sell in terms of return on investment. We've talked about some of the challenges um, that, that, that uh, hotels do face. Can you tell us a bit more about the numbers behind um, energies, uh, so the, the, the water heating solution? Sure. So uh, first I wanted to, to tell you that uh, here in the UAE alone, 
we, are, we have deployed our technology in 13 hotels, uh, among them uh, Anantara, uh, Radisson, Ritz-Carlton, Jumeirah, Jana Hotels, Miramar, uh, Fraser Suits, uh, Biblos Hotel. Uh, and, uh, and to give you some numbers in terms of savings first, uh, on the first year of operation, Fairmont Ajman uh, achieved 79%. They had a diesel boiler before, 79% uh, savings on the operational cost. Uh, on uh, Radisson data, uh, we have achieved 83%. Uh, they had diesel boilers as well. And finally, in Anantara de Palm, we, we achieved 87% against uh, electrical heaters. So um, in, in terms of, of payback, typically our system has a two to three years payback, uh, but it will depend, of course, on the, what installation is set up there. So the worst efficient solution is there the best we can achieve, of course. And of course, the tariffs, for example, it's easier to, to get a nice payback, a nice return on investment in Dubai, where the tariff for kilowatt hour is 44 fields, rather than Abu Dhabi, which is 20 fields. Um, to, um, to, to give you a, a good example of return on investment, Radisson Fujer, uh, exactly, uh, has, is on track to get a return on investment on 20 months. That will give you some, right. uh, some right. numbers. Okay. Yeah, very impressive. Very impressive. Thank you. So not only cutting down on carbon diesel emissions and carbon emissions significantly, but also a fairly straightforward business case, I would have thought, uh, for, for the it's finance no brainer, team. Right? It's a no-brainer, right? It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Uh, well, you, you would think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we would say that, of course, but yeah. there is so much in the process uh, in order to really achieve. I mean, you guys spoke about some of the challenges that you have. Uh, so you present something that makes sense, uh, that you can prove actually, uh, but then you, you, you need to, to move the wheels in order to get it. And a project like this might take from three months, if we're very lucky, until two years. It might take two years, so that's actually the, the payback time of the, of the project itself. I wanted to also add in, in regards to um, what's happening currently here in the city of Dubai. Um, so we all know that waste is a very big issue at the moment. So what the government has done is that the tipping fees have gone really up and companies and hotels are being more mindful in terms of uh, how do we now look for solutions such as uh, compost machines, which I personally believe at the resort 60% of the waste that is generated is from the food. And this is how now hotels are looking at, uh, looking at uh, compost solutions so that we can reduce the amount of food waste that goes back into the landfill. And as I said, uh, we do close the loop by achieving a circular economy. So that again reduces the cost in terms of uh, the amount of uh, money you pay to the waste companies by having your on-site solutions. And I mean, uh, UAE government has also uh, issued a law where 75% uh, of your waste should be repurposed on site. So they both work hand in hand, having a forecasting solution such as we know, and also having a compost on site will also give you a, 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 a good baseline of how you can close the entire loop. And that, I think you're in the process of implementing that at the moment, the composting, yeah? Correct. We are, we are exploring uh, options of uh, if we can get a waste master. Like I mentioned, we were, privileged of, uh, we were privileged to run the Australian pavilion where we had the waste master showcasing there. And 80% uh, of the, or 20% of the food that, uh, of the repurposed compost that comes from that goes back into the biofarms, which again uh, closes the loop. So we are in the process of uh, seeing whether we can uh, partner with Green Ecotech, because this is a company that they don't use any water, they don't, uh, don't use any chemicals. So this again reduces the costs of, uh, you know, the monthly AMCs that might come hand in hand on running such a machine on site. Maybe we can talk a little bit about hotel guests because obviously they are should be at the center of uh, what, what, what we're all here for and what we're doing and um, I think one of the challenges we spoke about Russell was the challenge that you know in many of the hotels in in the world and in Dubai particularly guests are paying a lot of money to to be pampered they want a, a luxury experience when they stay with stay in the property and obviously a luxury experience is not always very easy to align with the best environmental best practice. 
But I think one area where uh, we can agree, uh, sort of the, the uh, expectations of guests and um, the environment can come together very nicely, is in the kitchen. Can you say a bit more about what you're doing in terms of improving the quality and health, healthiness of the food at the same time as uh, improving its environmental footprint? Uh, listen, hotels, we know, and, and our industry is not, is not the kindest to the world, right? We know that we produce a huge amount of waste across, across the board. Um, and look, our guests are absolutely part of that journey. Um, but again, it's managing that, that expectation of, of what's doing the right thing and what I'm paying 10,000 dirham a night. Yes, I want my bed changed every day. Who's going to be brave enough to say, actually, mate, we don't do that anymore. It's, it's not the right thing to do. And I think uh, all brands collectively have a responsibility to, to really look at how can we educate our guests more because they're a huge part of the conversation. Um, and one of the challenges that we spoke earlier was, was, was obviously breakfast. And that's something that, that, that we're working on pretty hard at the minute to really reimagine what, what a good breakfast looks like. Now, obviously, when, when buffets were kind of taken off the table, when hotels were running at a 25, 30% occupancy, if you were lucky during COVID, um, it was easy to manage an a la carte scenario. But then obviously, thankfully, business came back incredibly quickly. Um, but how do you manage a five, 600 cover breakfast service and a la carte? The reality is you can't, that's the, that's the reality. But how do you responsibly create a breakfast buffet experience that manages waste? Because you're, you're, you're gonna get it for, for sure, it, it's gonna happen. Um, so we're kind of taking the, the route of do less but do it better. Um, you know, putting, putting people's health and well-being at the forefront. We're taking away all processed white sugar. Um, we are really driving a local sustainable story in terms of produce because it's fantastic. Uh, and again, I don't think we talk about that enough. Um, some of the food that, that comes, that's imported in really, as we know, when you do your local grocery shopping is, is, is like, if you find me a peach in Dubai in a supermarket that isn't like that, then, then tell me where that is because I'm going to go and buy it. The reality is the fruit that comes in this country is a disaster. It's, it's tasteless, it creates a huge amount of peelings because it, people expect to have fruit on their buffet. Um, so it, but it's still coming in, so what do you do with it? You can't just reject it. Um, how can you repurpose a, a pineapple that's sour as hell that you wouldn't give to anybody, but you've got 10 cases of it? If I send it back to the supplier, what are they gonna do with it? They're gonna chuck it in the bin. Mm. So you know, it's about how can we take that product that is perhaps not at its peak and then use a little bit of chef's magic to make it something delicious that's not full of chemical laden processed white sugar. So the whole poached fruit scenario is gonna, is gonna have feature heavily. Uh, we're moving away from nitrate laden cold cuts. You know, they're, they're carcinogenic and, and, and again, we don't talk about that enough. Um, and it's just, it's just doing less but telling a good food story at the same time. Um, and we're gonna trial it in June. I'm either going to get fired or uh, we're going to do something that hopefully creates a little bit of change across all, all, all brands. So look, let's see. But if we just do that and change it overnight and not tell anyone what we're doing about the how and the why, I'm not just talking about our, our team, but the guests are absolutely part of that journey. And I think we are, again, have a huge amount of work to do as, as brands to, to really try to tell a better story about what we're trying to achieve. And it has to come back across for me as intentional because you see every brand has got a great vision for the next 50 years. 50 years is too late. That's the reality, right? You need to fast forward everything 25 years uh, and accelerate it. Yes, there's a cost to it, but what's the ultimate cost of not doing it? And that's the question we're not asking enough. Um, so yeah, driving a bit more guest engagement, especially from a luxury, luxury sustainability, I think is gonna be our biggest challenge to really drive that. Um, but we have to start, we have to start now, because we're already too late. Yeah, that's very true, very true. I, I think from my point of view also, just to add on that question, um, you know, having worked, uh, I'm working in Jay, the resort, Jabal Ali Beach, uh, where we have about 25 restaurants and outlets, it's a massive operation, and the amount of food waste that's generated there, again, is uh, quite significant. Um, I think it also starts from a bottom-up approach where you have to involve your team members and have some green champions on ground who will also help you to educate your teams back of house in the kitchen and also back in the front of the house because as long as you have champions who are driving initiatives to reduce 
food costs or to reduce the food that's wasted, such as uh, uh, trippings and cuttings. And that also means that you need to have extra recycling bins uh, located strategically back of house areas where uh, these champions and the stewarding teams can also be involved with collectively, you know, segregating waste properly. And See, I, I segregation is the biggest challenge. Correct. Right? Yes. So, you know, we've got these massive, great big red bins that says food waste only, massive capital letters. But after a week, we were finding cans, we were finding glass bottles in there, tissues, like, how obvious does this need to be? But then we're thinking, hang on, we need to make it absolutely idiot proof. So it's now in translated into four different languages and we have, it's pictures now, we have pictures with a big red in it. And honestly, the impact overnight, because you assume that everybody can understand what you're trying to do, but you tell a better story through pictures and the reality is a lot of us are working with some casual staff who don't necessarily buy into the company narrative. They're just here for, for a 10, 12 hour day and they don't want to go home. So it's, it's, it's not just about getting a few champions in, it's everybody. Everybody needs to be a champion of sustainability because it's not just about four or five people's responsibility. It's, it's MD down, the steward down, up. It's everybody. And until we drive that better as an industry, because you know there's probably been about 10 panels that I've seen over the past, well, six months and everybody's talking a great story but what we're not doing is sharing data and we're not sharing tangible change um, and the costs because until we, we kind of get over the fact that yes it's gonna be expensive it is that's the reality we're looking to change all the, the toothbrushes the, the hairbrushes there's so much plastic in a hotel room I mean next time you go on holiday honestly just walk around the hotel room and see how much plastic is in it but to change that, you're looking at 50, 60% increase in costs. Luckily, I'm in a, in, a, in, a, in a building where we get the support to do that, um, and we're doing that. But, but yeah, we've got to go over the fact that everything costs money, it does. And that's where ownership, I think, is so important as well, where brands, when they're going to, to sign a contract with a, with a new owner, you know, guys, this is how we work. These are the costs involved. Are you prepared to lose 1% of your GOP by doing the right thing. Mm. But if you sell the story on a global issue, because at the end of the day, what's there in the next 25 years for our kids and our kids' kids? Because as an industry, we are not good. We are not good mm. enough. Um, we're in the best industry in the world from a hospitality perspective, but if you look past that and the damage that we do, and we have absolutely everything in our power to change it, but we're not fast enough. Um, some people do it better than others, for sure. But we have, we have a huge amount to do, for sure. And by talking about it, it's is absolutely the right thing to do. But then my fear is now, we walk off the stage, what's the takeaway from everybody? What's our takeaway? For sure I'm calling you, that's for sure. <laughs> um, and then we need to have a conversation because composting, it sounds great, but the reality is there's so much alkaline in compost that unless it's done properly, it actually damages the soil. And soil regeneration is the key to everything. Because it's great that we're composting, yay. Um, but unless it's done in a really controlled manner and it's tested, it will actually damage the soil. And right. without the soil, we're all screwed. That's the reality, because nothing will grow. So yeah. it's, uh, it's great that, that it's happening and it's working, but there's one or two steps past it we've really got to dig deeper into to make sure we're using the right partner for the right reasons. Um, but yeah, look, we're on, we're on the journey, but collectively we all have to be involved in this. Just wanted to say that most of the sustainable initiatives that are done in the, in the hospitality, most of them don't ruin the experience of the guests. They actually improve it. Yeah. I feel that people are looking more and more into sustainability uh, hospitality, um, and it's one of the decision the deciding points. Maybe not still the number one, but it it will become uh, soon enough. But when we are, for example, in our technology, when we are retrofitting a project. Uh, the property is just worried that we don't disrupt operation. We have to be as, as quiet and to do the job as good as possible to give the same experience that they had before, but in a, in a more sustainable approach. And all the guests, they, they benefit that. Uh, and we actually encourage the properties to show what they are doing. And I've seen some properties that actually do tours sustainability tours where the guests can go for half an hour or 45 minutes just looking at what the property is doing and inspiring people. I think that's, 
that's yeah. a good idea. That has, of, co of course, other things that, uh, that uh, are, I guess, almost sensible, like food, which I, I'm, of course, not an expert like you. Uh, but uh, most of the energy efficiency solutions that are implemented is to give the same experience with a much lower carbon footprint. Samuel, you've been involved in helping build, in partnership with a lot of other people in Dubai, a consumer-facing brand which is all about sustainability, uh, Dubai Can. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about how JNA Resorts have been involved? Well, tell us a little bit better. Maybe there are people here who don't know what Dubai Can is. Tell us about Dubai Can and tell us about the role JNA Resorts have played uh, and, and what's, what, what, it's, what it means to consumers. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, Dubai Khan is an initiative by the Crown Prince of Dubai. Uh, His Highness uh, Sheikh uh, Hamdan bin Mohammed Al, Al Rashid Al Maktoum. Um, this initiative is basically focused around uh, implementing water dispenser stations across key locations in the city and also in organizations having uh, solutions as to you know, getting clean water for free. Um, now for us at Jebel at Jay the resort or at Jay Resort and Hotels, uh, we were the first uh, group of hotels to Im fully implement this. By 2019, we had started the whole process. By 2020, just before the pandemic, we had fully implemented the water bottling plant and the dispensers across all outlets and uh, restaurants. Uh, one of the things that uh, DTCM, or Dubai Tourism and Commerce Economy, have uh, managed to actually do is to come over at the resort, collaborate with us as a hotel uh, space where we have actually fully implemented the project, and also our partner Trust Your Water, whom we partnered with them to have the solution on site. So they came over, they did a study, and uh, they did learn about how the whole process works because uh, they mentioned that we have set the industry standards in terms of hygiene, cleanliness, and the whole bot water bottling facility in itself is a food safety area. So you can imagine water is a very sensitive uh, topic, so we have to take the highest standards and make sure that we also have uh, surveillance in there, you know, separated the units for cleaning areas and, uh, uh, and, and filling stations as well. We also separate the team members who work there. Um, one of the things that we had fun during the project is that we, uh, we, we called our team the aqua team so that we can have some a little bit of fun with them. Um, the water dispensers also that we've installed across the key locations are able to tell you the amount of CO2 that's being reduced in the environment you're able to also log into your mobile phone and use an app and, and change the settings of the machine into sparkling water, cold water, or hot water. Um, we are able to also bottle about 3,000 uh, bottles a day, which is a one liter bottle. Uh, in the past, we used to give small uh, 330 ml bottles in guest rooms, which were plastic. So by increasing the size of the bottle to one liter, has also um, helped us a lot in terms of uh, guest requests of uh, you know, sending uh, bottles of water to the rooms. And uh, this was an initiative by His Highness that he wanted to see uh, you know, uh, Dubai being a city where you can walk around and you can easily have access to uh, you know, free water because at this part of the world, water can be a very expensive thing. Uh, on one hand, for us as a hotel, it's not only about generating revenue from water, but we're also giving guests an alternative to have water for free which we can see a lot of guests have uh, embraced and they talk very positively about it. We have labeled all our uh, glass bottles and uh, we also have taken a step further not only to focus on our guests, but also to focus on our associates and our staff. So we have given them JA Flask branded bottles so that uh, it also starts from the back of house. We have asked them not to bring any single-use plastics uh, you know, in the offices. And uh, that, that in itself, we've made them also sign a commitment and a pledge uh, that they will support you know, um, uh, the reduction of single-use plastic on site. So on one hand, it's been a very uh, interesting project. Um, we are not a big uh, full-scale plant like uh, you know, my Dubai, but it's a small, <laughs> it's a small bottling plant uh, at the resort. We have opened the doors to uh, the industry because we want to all achieve the same uh, goal. Um, so we've, in, we've welcomed uh, Jumeirah, we've welcomed uh, senior leadership from Atlantis, we've welcomed Rio, Sofitel, uh, Five the Palm, uh, Marriott and Hyatt. They have all come over there, uh, you know, to, for us to share knowledge with them and to get some best practices on how to implement a similar solution because obviously there are partners uh, in the city who are offering, you know, 
uh, such kind of solutions, but then again, they wanted to learn from us and see what we have done. And if we were able to do that at the resort, which is a very huge operation, then it's possible to do it in a, you know, a, a box hotel where you have, it's much easier to take uh, water up and down. Because we are a resort which is about 128 acres, uh, about a million uh, meters squared in size, and uh, with over 40 experiences and uh, 25 outlets and uh, restaurants, it's a very massive space. And uh, logistically, it's also, uh, you know, we had to think through how we are going to transport the water. Because we also had to invest in getting, uh, for example, a caddy that would transport the water around. And to have one of the associates uh, having a driver's license, that they can also transport water in bulk into one of the hotels, which is at the corner, Lakeview Hotel, our newest. So it, it has investment behind. It shows that uh, our leadership are committed towards uh, doing the right thing, like I mentioned. So for us, it's a social return on investment. We are supporting the UAE government and we are supporting the government of, of Dubai at the end of the day. And we are also aligning ourselves towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, in achieving uh, and driving the 2030 agenda. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you. We have a few minutes left, so I'll throw the uh, discussion open to the floor. If anyone has any questions. Oh. I really found this uh, discussion very enlightening. You've done an excellent work where you all are doing it. Um, I always come with this thing on the environment where, you know, we do all these things, what Samuel said about X amount, millions of microns and plastic. But do we actually tell why we are doing it? Well, who is the end beneficiary? So when we say environment, it, it is a very broad word, right? Um, so for example, you are trying to remove the plastic. So the plastic, I believe, so you, when you say to a guest, oh, you, we don't give straws, that's to save the fish. But then they go to the restaurant and then they order a fish. So there's some kind of a disconnect there. And I think if, if hotels and resorts start implementing more on the reason why they are doing, rather than, you know, like in, in, in the medical industry, you know, many of the doctors, they only address the symptoms, but they don't talk about the cause or what is the benefits, right? So I think that's, that's more of a kind of a complete approach. The other thing is that if you can have also influence, you know, at least 50% of your menu to be plant-based, because even if then there is a wastage, you can still use the waste for regenerative veganic farming, since you are already lighting on with organic farmers, and that will help with the regenerative soil, which Russell pointed out. So I think I think these are the goals. So what do you think uh, about this kind of? Look, I think uh, as, from a chef's perspective, it's something that we are we are absolutely driving. Uh, when you talk about plant-based, I think we get a little bit carried away with uh, meat alternatives and trying to drive the whole alternative proteins. The reality is most of the soy produced is GMO. Should we be really driving that story or should we go to the veg market and buy more vegetables? So that's something that I won't be entertaining anytime soon because if you're gonna drive a new billion dollar industry of um, plant-based products, that the reality is it's still heavily, heavily processed, still full of sugar, far too much salt, far too much fat, and then you're creating a whole new chain of packaging and then you're putting more trucks on the road to deliver this stuff. Is it the answer? For me, it's not. I think there's a, it's a good idea, okay, but I don't I, think we're there yet. Okay, I, I, have, I totally understand and yep. I totally agree with you on that. Uh, when I say plant-based and when I say veganic, I, I am not going to talk about the processed uh, products. I am totally against pro processing. I'm totally against it. And I'm sure a lot of chefs, they find it very uh, creative and challenging to make you know, dishes out of vegetables, beans, nuts. That's absolutely amazing food, which is, which is non-processed. Yeah, absolutely. And look, there's something that we, 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 as we're cultivating menus, we've had massive wins with our, with our banquets. It's probably 70% of our banquet menu, and across the board, are vegetarian, intentionally. But I don't call it out as vegetarian. They're just written on the menu as it should be there. And you tell a good story through how you write your menus. I'm not gonna put something in a corner or in a box. And I think we need to stop doing that. It's when you go to a hotel buffer, you've got your little corner with your token vegetarian dish. It shouldn't be that way. It needs to be mainstream. And we've got to change the mindset of how we tell a great vegetable story. Because mm. again, we're not good enough there yet. Um, and then when you look at our menus, you've got the, the token risotto at the bottom of the corner, right? And, but look, I'm seeing great change. You know, chefs are really embracing this. 
which is a huge step. Um, and when we talk about the, the plant-based alternatives, look, I'm not anti-processing. Um, I think we should tell a better story of, of, of great vegetables. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought out the vegetarian thing uh, in the menus. And in fact, one of the things which I educate uh, restaurants is you should just remove the vegetarian because if you are actually talking about environment, the milk and milk products are, are more environmentally disaster than, you know, meat. Because, of course, the meat is the end product of, of, of dairy. So I said, why not just have a vegan, a plant-based and, and non-vegan? You know, that's it. There should not be any vegetarian at all. Because, you, you, you know, you're confusing the whole, whole menu. And, and it becomes more easier, less uh, cost, when it's just either vegan or non-vegan. Look, uh, to change everyone's eating habits for the last 2,000 years is going to be a challenge. That's yeah, no, 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 I get that. <laughs> that's but, the reality. Well, um, you know, when we compare about the cost, uh, yeah. cost, uh, every kind of cost, yeah. right? The environmental cost and the cost of wastage. So the dairy wastage is very high. Anyway, so that's what was, uh, was my question. It was to actually take the whole vegetarian thing out and just keep it vegan or non-vegan or plant-based or whatever else. Um, I think thank I you. wanted to also uh, thank you for your question because I think you brought up something very important. How do we communicate with guests? I'll give you an example. For us at, at J Resorts and Hotels, what we do is we communicate with guests at, uh, through a digital platform called um, um, digital screens in the guest lobbies where they can see information about sustainability. Also in our guest rooms, we have uh, put a channel where we talk about our sustainability commitment so they can get more education from that. On our website at the moment as we speak, we are also looking at getting more information there for guests to be able to see the initiatives that we have, what we're doing as a resort, and we're also looking at alternatives on how we can start interacting and engaging guests to maybe move them around the resort and show them the water bottling plant from a back of house perspective. You know, move them around the bio garden and see what we are growing there. You know, like a sort of a sustainable tour while Absolutely. they're in-house. So these are alternatives that we're all looking at. And these are things that, uh, for, for, for instance, now that we're moving into 2023, where we're going to have the uh, COP28 workshop coming into the UAE, it's going to be very important for you know, companies or hotels to be able to have this sort of uh, uh, activations in place, because we'll have delegates traveling from around the world, governments and you know, climate change uh, activists who are super critical about uh, sustainability as a whole. So yeah, these are things we're going to be. Otherwise, yes. it's called greenwashing. Correct, yeah. So it's not only about, uh, you know, showing fancy reports or colorful insights, or, you know, it's about walking the talk. And for us, we do tell our guests or anyone who's interested in uh, finding out what we're doing to come over at the resort, and we'll show them that we are actually walking the talk. So right. thank, thank you so you much. Op open door policy. <laughs> thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. Maybe a couple of sentences about the most, some of the, 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 the most important thoughts that come to your mind based on your experience of implementing sustainable solutions in the hospitality sector. Just two or three lines that really sum up for you, whether it be the challenges or, or, or solutions to sustainability in hospitality. Look, for me, collaboration is key. Without sharing information, sharing data, sharing best practices, with the ultimate aim that it's gonna improve everybody's lives in the next 20, 30, 50 years. It's a, it's a generational thing. Um, look, I believe we can do it, but I think, you know, it's great to have, have these discussions, but I want to see more tangible action and sharing the absolute wins, I think, is, is, is key for me. You go. Well, I have to say action, because uh, like Russell said, uh, why do we need to wait 30 years, 50 years to, to reach your objectives? I, I mean, uh, private sector and, uh, and public sector together, that we, can, we can do even better. And, uh, and there is no reason not to implement proven, reliable technologies. Uh, and there is so many tools in the market to, to make it fast. So it's not only about a capex investment, uh, there is invest, there is hybrid solutions, finance, there is ESCO solutions in the market, and the government is also here to, to assist. Um, I think I agree with uh, collaborations. I'm a strong advocate for the sustainable development goals, particularly goal number 17, which talks about collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, I think I personally believe that uh, when we create uh, good relationships and maintain them uh, with a win-win approach, 
and uh, with the attitude of what's in it for us, as opposed to what's in it for me, then I believe we are able to accelerate positive change. Uh, collectively, especially now that we are looking at supporting the United Nations Development Goals 2030 Agenda, uh, this will also strengthen the UAE's circular economy. And for me, uh, I believe that let's walk the talk, let's collaborate more, and leave no one behind. Sustainability is not a plan B because we do not have a planet B. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, all of you. That's been a really, for me, a really insightful conversation. Uh, I can feel all of your passions around the various topics we've covered. And I'm sure if anyone in the audience would like to continue a conversation either now or uh, via LinkedIn, uh, I'm sure any of the three speakers would be very happy to. There's a wealth of experience here and some real passion around sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much in the audience for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Keith Thank also. You.